This is Hacking the Afterlife podcast with Jennifer Schaefer. Jennifer, how are you? Fabulous. What's going on? Yesterday, somebody wrote to me and said, in Alabama, they're banning the word namaste. (laughs) Because somehow it's like poisoning the minds of Alabamans. And I tried to say to this person, you know, it's like banning chow or aloha. It, you know, it's the same it hello and goodbye. Sense. Right. I see, I see the spirit in you, which is in me. Like, it, it, what's wrong with that? Unless your haters, maybe they should ban it from Alabama. You know, maybe I don't know, but you know, <laughs> uh, it. it I, and also, it means I have some friends in Alabama. I love them. I just but, don't. But it does. Never, it, it I'm also, never going to send my daughter there, though. For school. It is a spiritual concept, though, which is. Wait, wait, what meditation had the same connotation years, ten years ago? Okay. Which picks up from our last podcast where we were talking about meditation, right? Well, you maybe sure, don't remember. I remember everything. <laughs> yeah, right. Because you've had clients between here and there, and I've had these trees behind me. I like to call them. I like to call them experiences. That's right. That's right. Experiences. And in my case, I mean, I talk about this often, you know, meditation, the word itself, bugaboo, med means uh, to measure in Latin. So since the time of the Romans, they were measuring thought, and it's not something that's impossible or hard to do, and people are afraid of it. But namaste, literally namaste means I acknowledge the spirit that's within you. Yes that we can't see, but has been around for who knows how many lifetimes. And you're bugging me again with that cappuccino (laughs) that the barista is offering you. Wait a minute, didn't you poison me back in the Roman era? I think you did. You can have your cappuccino. That's why I'm only sticking to possibly one. (laughs) Very good. All right, so. I assume that Luana wants to talk to us today. I don't know. I, you well, know, she, we're got a little me, bit... she got me in my office. I'm pretty sure she does. Okay, well, let's I find out. Know. She says she's exhausted with us. <laughs> like she's exhausted with everything that we're connected to right now because there's so much going on. Okay, well, that's a good question, Lou. Oh, by the way, Luana, your movie that you made with Francis Coppola in 1963 is being re-released or being released on Blu-ray this week. <laughs> Okay, I just have to tell you, because I haven't told you this. I was at the Coppola's house on Sunday. What? I got to see pictures of Nicolas Cage when he was super young. I got to see um, (laughs) where he lived with Johnny Depp in the back house of his grandma's house. And how they, how he told Johnny Depp, you need to be an actor. Here's my agent's number. Wow. Yeah. So, but are you from. And then you posted that. And I'm like, I actually sent you, was sending you a text. And of course, shiny ball never finished it. And then just erased it when I had to text you about, are we meeting today? Maybe, you know, (laughs) maybe. Yeah. All right. But hold on. Hang on a second. So let's just clarify this. So you weren't aware that Luana was very good friends with the Coppola family. Not at all. Okay. No you idea. aren't aware that Luana and I went to their house for eight years in a row for Thanksgiving dinner. No, I am not no. aware. Okay. So Luana, why did you send Jennifer to Francis's house this past weekend? To see everything and to connect with, there was a, there was a film crew that was there. And one of the nephews of the Coppola's was, They were reading, they were testing parts. Doing a reading. Okay. Auditioning. Yeah. Yes. But I read a couple of the crew members and a couple of like. That's hysterical. I have pictures if you want. Well, no. So let me ask, were you at that? Were you at their house in Rutherford, which is a little bit further beyond the Nebom Coppola winery? No, I was in, I was at the the grandmother's house that's in West Hall, that's in Hollywood. Oh, okay. That's fascinating because I know you went to wine. Off off of Melrose. Okay. I know that you went to uh, the wine country. I did go to the wine country and I read a bunch of people there too. Okay. So let me ask Luana this question uh, and clarifying that, (laughs) which is this house in West Hollywood. It was an older house. Is that right? 
It was the house where Nicolas Cage and Johnny Depp lived in. Oh, pr- okay. My shoulder house. So it's I'm going to ask Luana, had you ever, Luana, had you ever been in that house? That's the question. Yeah, she has. And was it at a party uh, with Nicholas's father? It was a get together. I think they were doing the same thing, reading material. I'm not sure. All right. So it could have been some point in her career. There, because Luana, like I say, we went up to the Coppola house for eight years because she was very close with Francis and he directed her in uh, his first film called Dementia 13, which comes out this week. And also the one that The Outsiders, right? Did he do something with the no, Outsiders? No, no. Well, Francis directed The Outsiders. So, and we've had conversations. Weird. About that yeah. is weird too. Well, not weird. <laughs> Normal in our world. Somebody, but- somebody in the same week that you posted it, but I didn't tell anybody. I don't, you know, they're not going to care if I told, you know, because like, I'm, I'm being discreet about who I read, but yeah. other than the film crew, which could be anybody, but um, it, it was, I went there on Sunday and then that person, you know, with the outsiders and you posted something about Francis Ford Coppola and the people that I was with were, you know, August had a big play in their life. Um, it just, it was just fascinating to me. No, it is. It is. It is fascinating. And because I've never discussed that with you. No, we never have. They've but been it, it, over there forever. Well, yeah. and, so Lou, do you want to show Jennifer? I mean, I might as well just tell her. Oh, like, when, can I show you? I can show you this. I'll show you a couple of pictures that you will appreciate. Well, I was just going to say when one Thanksgiving, Nick Cage came to, and he wanted to show his father, which is Francis Coppola's brother, August, the tattoo on his back. Oh, wow. That's good. That's August. So you're that's saying that's the house that August owned. Is that true or no? Yeah. It's the house that either his grandmother owned. And then look at this. Look how cute this is. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so hold on. So Nick's brother, Christopher, there's, mm-hmm. two, there's two brothers. They're both filmmakers. Nick's uh-huh. making a movie with uh, Francis Coppola's producer as we speak, Fred Roos. And this is all of... There, I, I want Luana to talk about this location because it's as, as surprising it is for me to hear that Jennifer was at this house. I've been to this house because I knew the Coppola grandmother uh, and I also knew uh, the grandfather. Okay. I didn't tell you about that, but that was her house. I and think you did. You mentioned it was oh, in the family, I but I know who that is. Okay. But I don't know. So yeah, it was the grandmother. All right. And so there okay. was a party at this house okay. that Luana and I went to. And I want Luana to put it in your mind if she wants to, because some funny things happened. That night. At the bathroom. Well, it was out in, out in the, you, you did you notice there was a backyard? Right. And there that's was a- where that's where Nicholas and Johnny Depp lived in the back house. OK, that was the back but you know, there was like a patio and a courtyard. I went out there. Yes. So we were sitting out in the courtyard. And the thing about Luana, as much as she's a fantastic listener now and helping people on the flip side, she was like an Olympian in terms of listening. Uh, I would leave her alone in a party for 10 minutes. I'd come back and a person would be pouring out their life story. Friends of mine that I had known forever saying like really intimate. She was a really excellent listener. And one night we were there at that house and somebody, somebody's wife sat down with uh, Luana. She was French. And when I came back, this woman was trying to kiss her, was trying to kiss Luana. Lou, do you want to show Jennifer that moment? I mean, I just told you, but. Do you want to talk about that? What was going on? Well, she actually wanted to see what it was going to be like. Luana did. Mm -hmm. Well, it was just funny because the woman mistook her generosity. Totally. I totally get that. That's what she's saying. She goes, but I didn't stop it. But then I did. But what was funny was the awkwardness of it because... Luana was not she ready. Said, she said, do you think the awkwardness might have come from you? <laughs> well, no, I was I was walking back with drinks, you know, 
there, I'll get you some drinks. And I come back and this woman's literally like wrestling with Lou, trying to get that lip lock on there. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. She, anyway. has, she said true story. And it was right on the stairs that I was in, like right the stairs is it be right before you go out to the patio. So the, the husband oh, in the that, corner, she said, not, not on the stairs. Sorry. So the husband of that woman, plays into the story and that's why i'm asking do you want to talk about by the way was it one of the coplas yeah <laughs> yes. she said that to me i wasn't going to say it because i got confused i'm like yes you're at the copla family yes all right and so now i'm going to tell you the story uh it, august copla the father of nick cage and christopher copla really smart very handsome really dashing guy one of the first spirits I described to somebody that I know, which I won't mention her name, but I've known her for the last, since Jack was like seven and Jack's 18 now, so we can do the math. I saw a spirit and it was actually him correlated to somebody else. That is how the whole reason why I was even there on Saturday was because. Of, oh, I see. It would happen to be, and I'm trying to think of the mom's name. It's not someone, you know. It's not even. Oh, 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 a mom of somebody else. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it later. But she, th there's so much to this that you and I can talk about. But what I'm saying is that <laughs> this started playing out 12 years ago, back in 2009. That's when what? I first met August in Spirit. Oh, well, that's unusual. Yes, it are is. we? And, and so you're so you're saying that you and I have had this weird connection before we met. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, I like that. I then, like that. I but I must tell you, I there was so much that happened in between, and blah 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 blah. And this person, I get it. That I, I get what you're saying. To, that he showed himself, to, and he was so, always wearing a white shirt, very crisp. Je you know, jeans. He was always just, you know, there were, I had no idea that it was a Coppola. Had no idea. Wow. But I described this person to he explained how artistic he was and how he wants to help it. Like it was just the craziest experience because at that time, back in 2009, 2009, 2009, who says that? 2009. I didn't n understand what I was seeing or hearing or, or what, like I don't I didn't have that confidence that I do now. Yeah. And it's not no, no. It's about getting out of the way so they can come through. It's, I'm not, there's no hierarchy. I just, I'm not, I don't have any fear about it. But when somebody back then, I was like, this is really weird, but. No, yeah. and it's, uh, I, you so, know, I must, I must yeah. say it's, it's all, blown my mind. All these things that it took for me to get to this place. And you know me now. I'm I met a lot of different actors and that whatever. Yeah. And well, well, Luan, let's ask Luan. Let's ask Luana because she's the one who's the conduit here. She's the connection. She knew August. Yes, she um, said she said, and that's so funny that he's up there. Of course he of course he's in there. Of course they were there. And I actually asked him to be there, but I didn't know that they knew them. I didn't know. I always ask Luana whenever I go to do events. I'm like, can you please be here? Or what? So let's ask Lou, does she, does August want to talk to us? Not right now, she says. Okay, very good. That's why I, I, I toss it over to her because look, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot we can do and work with. And I don't want to step on any toes. You don't want to step on any toes. We, you know, we don't like to and step it's not, on toes. And it's not, the, it's not the point. The whole I think the one of the things that I want our listeners to know that time is so condensed when I look at things. I saw things back in 2009 that happened now, like, but I didn't understand it. And I forgot about it, of course, yeah. but I was reminded of it, of everything, everything I said, everything that, and, and so when you think about time or you think about things, like when things start happening, you don't understand it. It doesn't mean they're not going to happen. It just isn't going to happen on your timeline. But right. our, our guides are working for us. They've been working for us, like from whether you, I can't prove it, but our past lives to our lives here, to us meeting, to me reading, listening to your book on Thanksgiving and being so excited to Facebook friend you and like, have you say yes? <laughs> I was the biggest dork. I was at a party. I jumped up. I'm like, Richard Martini said yes. And they're like, Jen, 
who the F is Richard Mulvaney? <laughs> but, you know, I just want to point out to our audience members two things. One is, those who've been tuning in for a while, generally, when Jennifer and I ask for somebody to come forward, they do come forward. But this they is do. to point out, they don't always come forward. And that's every every right for them. And it might be for a variety of reasons, like they don't want to interrupt and someone's I, path. And I actually ex- I actually expect them to come forward. So it's yeah. weird I get told no, but I know that I'm not thinking that. So I know that I'm not thinking. There's that. And then there's this other weird connection here, which is, of course, Luan and I knew each other for 20 years when she passed away in 1996. And now here we are having this conversation with Luana, how many years later, 40, whatever it is, talking to her about events that occurred back in the 80s that she's aware of. She just showed me a time capsule. I went and then she's showing me like it's almost like a collage, like almost like I'm like a cartoon that walked out there. And then it's like. I'm in that same space that you guys were in, the same energy that you guys were in, the same history that you guys were in. And it's happening all at once. Well, there's also that moment that you and I were talking about your wedding and the awareness that you had while you were being married that someone was watching you. And I said, well, let's examine it. Let's go to that moment. You're on the altar. You're getting married. Who's watching you? Look over your shoulder. And you said, it's us. It was you in a restaurant in Manhattan Beach looking back at your wedding, but back at the wedding, seeing somebody observing you, but it was you observing you. And knowing why, which we discussed. And then that was, that part was crazy too. So that's like a right outside of time. So Lou, is that what, who do we, is is that what you wanted to talk to this today? Or, or you have somebody on your list that we need to chat with? Time. She says that we wanted to discuss time and the fact that everyone is getting so frustrated with it, but they need to know that every second, every act, every thought is working towards something better, something greater for you. Everyone just wants, thank you. Everybody wants instant gratification of now, 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 but she's like, the best things happen. Like have this moment that we've had. Without discussing it, you had no idea. And the fact that I was texting you that I'm like, I just was at the Coppola's house and didn't send it, right? Yeah, no, I, you, didn't, you didn't mention that. I thought you meant Napa, but you were talking about the West Hollywood house. Yes, they own houses all over the planet, by the way. But this is a very special home with all the nostalgia of all the pictures of the boys and the thought like. And I haven't been there since 1980, you know, whatever. And, and so it, and it's that's still, fantastic. And they haven't changed it. It is still that. That's great. You know? um, so that must be, that probably is likely the home that Francis still owns because it was his mom's. 1930, it's a 1930s home. And, and I'm sure they probably stay there when they come into town. And, and so, like I say, for those who are, who are curious about Luana Andrews, just search Dementia 13, which was a film made by uh, Roger Corman. And Francis directed it, and he was the sound man on a movie called The Young Racers. And while he was filming that with Luana, he said, "Why don't?" Said to Roger, "Why don't we make this movie in Ireland?" And so on the way back from the trip, he and Eleanor Coppola, who was the costumer, and other people, friends of theirs, all stopped in Ireland to make this film. And Luana is one of the actors in it, but you know, in my mind, she stars in it. But of course, other other people were in it and starred in it and she you know stuff happens to her early on but let's suffice to say that uh i've had some unusual experiences with this film because in the 1990s lou and i went to santa fe for a reunion of easy rider uh people as well as there was a festival santa fe festival and they were honoring zoetrope and so it was hard for us to get in because we didn't hadn't made reservations and stuff. And so at the last minute, we were at the front door of the theater saying, can we please get in? And somebody went, oh, oh my gosh, there's Fred Roos, a friend of Luana's. And he went, yeah, just come in with me. So the only seats left in the house were the front row. So we went down to the front row and sat down, just so grateful to be inside the theater because we weren't uh, invited, you see? And now the, and the curtain goes down, the curtain goes up, and now the screen, and it's Luana from Dementia 13. That's crazy. Literally. <laughs> in my face you know it was just a funny connection and now here we are 
talking to her, literally, on the flip side, and her film is coming out. So any thoughts about that? about your film coming out about Francis and he does the DVD and the, it's so crazy. It is it's crazy. crazy to me, so how did, how I might my question, Lou is how did Francis come upon this idea of re remastering it? Cause I know they had lost the copyright at some point, but somehow they were able to get it back. I want it back again. And she showed me Nicholas cage. So I don't know. And uh, Nick was involved with it or with uh, yeah, involved yeah. with acquiring it maybe. Nick is doing a movie right now with Fred Roos, the guy who produces all the friends and Luana's good friend. Uh, and so I got an email from Fred there in Montana or something. And he's and Nick is doing his first Western. So he's pretty excited. Oh, I was going to tell you the story. By before... way, that's weird because I'm supposed to, I was supposed to go to see, <laughs> I was supposed to go to Montana to see my girlfriend, Cindy Kaza, who does the whole Zer file. She's a great medium. One of my dearest friends. I love her love her i was supposed to go there but i'm going to portugal now and i can't go but um oh. she's in montana filming as well oh it's i wonder so maybe weird. she's working on the film she's not working on the film she's doing something else, doing something with else. like a but i was going to tell this i was going to tell this story which is i was in the kitchen at the coppola house in napa valley when okay. i was having lunch with august we were sitting at the you know the big dining room table having a cappuccino or something just chatting away and Nick came into the room and said, Dad, I got a tattoo. 17-year-old son. And I'm thinking to myself, really? You're here coming in to tell your dad I got a tattoo? <clears throat> Who would ever hear that conversation? And I thought he was going to, you know, roll up a sleeve, you know, and flex, you know, Betty Lou. He lifted up his shirt and his entire back was a dragon. Painted dragon. <laughs> his whole back. And... And his father's reaction was just so cool. And so, I mean, he was such a, an interesting cat. He kind of like, you know, pulled his chin a little bit. And he said, is that going to hurt your career? And of course, no one's ever seen his back in a movie. So I guess not. No one. No one. Um, anyway, I just happened to be there at that little moment in time. And, wow. and here we are talking to August or talking about August and talking about his hilarious <laughs> son. Hilarious <laughs> son. Nick's a, a really a talented guy. And, yeah. and really off the wall and funny and, you know, bless his heart. They have, they have a great family. It's very, when I was at that house, there was a, I had no idea again. Yeah. And you just, held up a picture briefly of the four boys. They wouldn't and, mind. They wouldn't and mind. Giancarlo is also in that photograph. Did I show you? Did I do yeah, this? Yeah, you did. And, okay. and so, of course, Gio was their son that they lost. You know, he was in a hey, boating accident. I, I was just informed of that, 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 so I picked up on that when I was there. I knew nothing about that. Did you talk to Gio? Um, or do you want, you don't, you don't want to say, you don't have to. I, I don't want to say. Okay, that's fine. Lou, do you have any, uh, sorry, I'm still taking a picture of it. Do you I'm... have anybody on your clipboard that we need to chat with? Um, she showed me you. Okay. Me? Uh huh. What do you want to say about me or? No, it was about the girl. Hold on. She actually did want to kiss her. Oh, that's Hold fine. On. And she says, all of this has been meticulously organized. So the fact that all, like the fact that this has been going on, I mean, think of all the different people we know, right? And that, you know, on the flip side and people that are here, they're, the fact that I was there is still crazy town to me. And I do this work for a living, but I'm never, you know, I'm, I'm not like, I'm, how do I explain this? I'm not in, there's no hierarchy with mediums. I know that I have, I'm in LA. I have a lot of clients that are very well known. It wasn't like, you know, wow, I'm at the, it was a more very interesting. The wow came when I saw you posting something about Coppola's and then somebody else posting something about Coppola's <clears> and then something like, Wait a second. I had no idea. I, I you know, and it's mind boggling to me, of course. No idea. No idea. Jennifer and I have known each other six years. You think we know everything about each other, but, um, you know, and the thing about Lou is that she, it, and the way that we reconnected with Francis. So Luana had was close friends with him and Eleanor, and then they all separated because Luana went off and became a Buddhist 
and in the uh, and the SGI group. And a lot of people were, you know, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, they would like this when they came around. I'm just saying a lot of our friends sort of disappeared. They just, they just didn't understand it. They didn't understand it. However, we now all embrace it, by the uh, way. Exactly. But but now in 1979, this is after I had met Luana, we were at film school together. And I went to a screening of Apocalypse Now in Westwood and Francis was there. And after the screening was over, I found myself coming out of the theater and standing right next to him. And I thought, what's something I can do to say hello? And I just said, I'm friends with Luana Anders. And he had came right around to me and he said, tell her to call me. And I said, oh, okay. And so now I, I, I go, you know, I'd say to Lou, oh, you know, I ran into Francis and she's like, what? What do you mean? You talked to him? Like, why? Why did you go up and speak? You know, she was very like, private she's a very private person yeah. and i said well lou I, she's like not anymore yeah so not anymore but he was there and so that led to eight years of us going up to their house every thanksgiving and i mean just a oh, beautiful amazing. beautiful home beautiful people um what can i say other than just they were the most generous to me not knowing me i was the guy who played the piano well you know so they were feeding their friend luana who was really, uh, you know, somebody they loved dearly. And so, and they named a tree, I think, after her. And, and there was this cottage up there that she used to always stay in. And she went up there as more times than I. So, but it was just her. unusual. She so I've her. always been hugely fond of them. And I went to a, a screening of Apocalypse Now, maybe, I don't know, a year ago. And I went up to Francis, who I hadn't seen since uh, that boat trip. And I said, uh, by the way, Luana says hello, meaning yeah. we've had conversations with her. And I sent him a copy, two copies. I mean, a copy of our first two books where we interview a number of people. Now, I don't think Francis is somebody who accepts that life goes on. I don't think that's. He's, she's saying, and then she shows me her other buddy. It's too painful. Too painful. Harry um, Dean Stan. Correct. Thank you. It, I love it. Why can't my husband do that? Well, what's funny about Harry Dean is that Francis, of course, worked with Harry Dean and he was very close to Harry Dean. He's in The Godfather 2. And, and that's why I sent him the thing, because Harry Dean was close to him. And if Harry Dean could tell us to believe in the possibility of an afterlife, because then you won't waste another minute of your life arguing about it. I figure, well, that would be. So I don't I doubt if he's looked at the books. But Lou. This is a very unusual conversation we're having. And if somebody that Jennifer knows eventually mentions it to uh, Francis, that would be, you know, that would be fun. I don't know how you're going to pull that off, but it's fine. Well, this person that brought me up there is a dear friend of mine and is working with Coppola's cool. and is very interconnected. I'll let, I'll very say Very good. That. Aren't we all? <laughs> I know. I know. Right. Right. Um, all right, so Lou, back to me. Yes, just kidding. Back, yeah. Just kidding. Why no, did you? He wanted you to say the, that story about how you guys. That's so crazy. Okay, yeah. and so on your list there, your VIP list. I don't want to be the person gets in the chair. Let me out of the chair. Who do we want to talk to? She still wants to talk to you, Rich. I'm not going to say no. So please, okay. let me figure please it out. go on. Continue on, Lou. What What do you want to talk about? Process. How we connect. It's your dream, your dream state. I know. Oh, geez. No, I had a, a really bizarre dream last night. Okay, don't say anything. Don't let me see because that's what you're saying. <laughs> is that the dream, Lou? Is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about dreams? She just went like this. No, she just went like that, which is more so. All right, what was that and about? I was so caught up. It was so, your subconscious was just saying, she showed me like you yelling, like, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> Like getting mad. Is that how I yell? And you didn't you didn't thank the actors at the end, like you told me to, which is a lifesaver, which I tell everyone to do. And well, she said that you have to you have to you keep getting ahead of yourself and that you get angry now in your dreams, I think. I don't know. Or it shows up that way. So annoyed. Like, annoyed, perhaps. Angry, I don't I, know if that's no, right. not angry, annoyed. You get annoyed because it's yeah. it's about timing and it's about um Feeling like you're being held back. Um, show me again. 
this whole conversation, she's grabbing your face and she's going, we've got this. Well, you know, when, when I, so in reference to what she's saying, and of course I'm not here, she's just talking in general about dreams. I mean, really, and this is for everybody. It's not just for me. Okay. It's the idea. The idea will be made for everybody. Yes. Yes. And, uh, and that's why it's important for us to talk about it because people, of course, they have dreams that are disturbing or annoying or, you know, get them crazy. And then they, they want to work out what, what are the details. And what Luana's saying is that, what, that the dreams are the flip side's way of helping you work out things? She says they're not the truth. Well, yeah. That goes not the truth. She goes, think about all the things you make up in your head. You might say the truth when you're out of your dream state. She goes, but your dreams, she's showing me like boxing. <laughs> like I get in fights apparently in my dreams. I I call, I call my subconscious an asshole. I'm like, why are you so mean to me in my dream state? <laughs> but I have been given some nice dreams lately, so I'll take it. But she's sharing with me. Hold on. Okay. She says, don't become upset with your progression because you're, she's saying you feel this way, but you're actually so far ahead of where you're supposed to be that it's just taking time for everything to catch up. Thank you. And then she just showed me about for instance, meditation and Buddhist, like how long it took for that to catch on or to become something that was uh, scientifically proven. Exactly. And so our work, people can, you know, if you're still watching this and you don't believe it, you've wasted your time, but (laughs) like, don't watch it if you don't believe it, you know? Um, But she says, she really needs you to know that it's going to get, that it will be better that things just haven't connected, but they will connect. Okay. I just want to clarify. Like with super glue, like with super, like it's going to be. Things will all come together like gel or gel together to make sense. And uh, no, I know it's, I think I'm, she's referring to a number of things. One is I had a conversation with a film producer today and that she might be referring to that, that that may come together and gel. But and, and in terms she says, of she says the way you want it, she's putting you in the producer chair. And but what's funny about this concept of a dream, I had this semi annoying dream because it was just a, 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 from a logical sense. It was like, what is this? Where am I? What am I doing? I was with two friends of mine, two you know close people, and we were going to a funeral and it was very difficult to find parking. And then it was like. Once we finally parked, we like went into this ante room and it was like, there were so many people at this funeral that we had to sit like in a room beside a room, besides a room. The person who had passed away was somebody who passed away back in 1968. So it's not like, so that was weird. As well as the two of them, my two close associates handed me their pistols so that I could put them somewhere while they sat down for the funeral. And I, my mother, and a friend of mine. So it was like, <laughs> what is this annoying dream? Because I was aware of it. At some point, I started to wake up and I was like, what the heck was that about? Because it went on forever. And then I kind of went I went back to the thought of, well, thank you for playing the role of mom and my friend Paul. But they are over on the flip side. So maybe that was them playing the role. Anyway, without us trying to parse what the heck that dream was about. That they were all actors. And I'm sure, and what Luana is also saying is, don't worry about the dream you're having. Try so to make that, sense out of it. To, she says that it takes up your, she goes, if you'd follow your own advice, like saying, thank you, because yeah. that's not the tight you guys, please, if there's anything that you can learn from this, please know that when you wake up in the morning, you're like, that was wonky. I didn't like that. Just go, thank you. Thank you for actually playing those characters that I've, yeah. Needed to deal well, with. I always think and to myself that I invent this. And please try not to do it again. There is a difference. Maybe we need we need to go into it. When you have a when you have a loved one come to you, that's a real dream. Okay. When you have a loved one that comes to you and you start thinking that they're mad at you or that you did something wrong about their death, that's your subconscious. No one talks like this in your dreams. No one does. It's all projections of love and thoughts. But if you're in your dream state 
and you think that they're mad at you, that is all you. That's your subconscious. Your loved ones will come up to you and you will feel joy. And if you're stupid like me, you will say, wait a second, you're dead. And the second you do that, it's gone. Yeah. It's gone. And when, and I even, I'm like, no, no, no. Like I remember telling my dad, cause I could feel his hair. I could smell him. I could hear him like hold on to him. And then I realized I'm like, wait, this is a, this is a, that's when it went wonky. And my subconscious was just I'm like, wait a second, you're gone. And then I just, I've never cried so loud before in my life to the point where my son came running upstairs. My husband was like, what's wrong? What's wrong? You know? And I was just like, I couldn't even speak for like 10 minutes because I couldn't even catch my breath. And like, it wasn't a bad dream. I got to see my dad, but then I realized he was gone. And that love, I wouldn't trade that for anything. Was that a good dream or a bad dream? I don't know. I, the process that we have in our dreams, I'm trying to relate to people because I think our dimensions are so close. They're so super close that we can't tell. We can't tell. And oh, let's ask Luana about that. Is that is that a progression of events? In other words, sorry, she just showed me. Like, I'm like, are we close? She just went right in front of me. She's like, uh, yeah, we're right here. Remember? But for those who aren't a medium, whose filters aren't adjusted, everyone's yeah. a medium. They just don't know it. But I'm just saying now. For example, uh, the filmmaker Paul Schrader. The card counter the movies just coming out. He wrote Taxi Driver. He wrote about a dream he had the other night where Harold Pinter, the playwright, came to him and he, he said to uh, Paul, I want to help you with your next screenplay. And Paul said, Well, you're dead. And the guy and Harold Pinter said, Yeah, I know. But like, what's the problem? Because I want to help you. And then at some point in the dream, Paul went to somebody else and said, Hey, Harold Pinner wants to help me with my screenplay. And that person said, well, he's dead. And I said, I know I try. I tried to argue with him. But my question to you, Lou, not about Paul Schrader's dream, but is it that people are the veil is thinning to such a point where people are now allowing themselves to talk about these things they never talked about before? Wow. So what I just heard, she goes, there is no bell. And so I went to, well, was, it, was there a veil before? And she goes, only, it's only been by a human construct to protect your soul. Like, so whatever your beliefs are. Or protect been, your brain, let's say. There's never, if there is one, there's never been a, I'm sorry, I have to laugh. Um, there never has been a veil. Ever, she says. I have never heard that before. Either I. So, Lou, you're saying, and, and We've talked about this, Dr. Grayson, in his book, after he talks about filters that people have. And when they have a near-death experience, they bypass the filters to see what's really going on. And what we're talking to, about to you is about what's really going on. Go okay, so what she showed me, so when you were discussing that, like when you get rid of the filter, she just started showing me people running and a huge tsunami coming in. <laughs> and I need to understand what sh why she's showing me that. Um it's a huge tsunami of energy. So once you, once it's like a whole thing of energy that comes in and you just need to take a deep breath. That's why meditation is so important. So, you know, So is it a tsunami of information or energy? It's information for me because I can, she's laughing well, because I can control the energy and she goes, no, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's no. All right. As opposed to yes. She goes, no. no, she goes, no, she's your finger. No, but she said that it's information for me, but for other people that don't know, they're picking up energies from everywhere. Okay. And it's not bad. It's nothing bad. Nothing that she's saying that. Okay. Thank you. There's no bad energies that can come hang out with you. They can't get into your energy field. It doesn't work. There has to be a lock. There has to be a lock with energy of. All right. Is Let's just talk about that for a second. So if so, let's say people who do have that experience of having negative energies showing up, are you saying that that's because they're open to that? What? She's saying that it's in their mind. It's in their mind. It's not actual. They're not negative energies. They're just people. It's a human, it's a human construct. Okay. And it's, is it fear-based? It's like they feel an energy of somebody and then they create it. 
all of it. And there's some people that are there's some people that are wonky that are around you. You get the chills if there's something bad going on. You also get the chills if you have your loved ones around you. There's warnings, but there's you know, there's also things that happen for the greater good. Things that, that happen for the greater good. Moana, let's just talk about that for a second, which is you're referring to it's like a play. We're in a play, or all part of this play, and things that seem to someone be bad gets, on someone gets shot. Somebody things that happen on stage that appear to be bad might be for the greater good. Is that correct? Correct. She just showed me. Um, oh, I'll think of it. What's the famous play that has made a gazillion dollars that we all love um, that I sent my son to? Hamilton. Thank you. <laughs> and Hamilton, greater good. Hamilton died for the greater good. Oh, is what she you're saying. Showed me being shot. Like things started changing. Things started, like there was. All these things that happened, there's just things that happen for the greater good. It's not. What? I always check. I'm like, so does everything happen for a reason? And she said, yes. Yeah. So I'm like, fuck you. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. Well all right, but let's go. Let's go down this path for a second. The greater good, and this is a this is a bugaboo. Many people bone of contention, it's which is bad. Not going to go over well. What say again? I said it's not going to go over well with people. Well, that's okay. It's okay if we allow that. There's a construct involved. The play. Who's the playwright, Lou? She's like you. All okay, very good. Play. We are the playwright. That's what I thought the answer was. We create the play, we create the scenario, the actors that we cast and put in roles perform on stage, correct? On stage and off stage in our dream state, yes. In our dream state. So people who leave the stage early, the curtain falls down, they go home. And they try to communicate with us and some of us are able to hear them. Correct. So, like may- so when trying to give people the answer to why do bad things happen? To people why would they choose a role that was so difficult because they're tr- okay hold on because they don't want to come back and so no they- no but i'm saying i understand there are people here who don't want to come back and i always say well don't raise your hand next time they're looking for volunteers keep no, your no. hand down the people that want the most like the people that that and she's referencing herself that pick so many things to go on in this lifetime, she says, want to feel everything, but also are wanting everything to happen all at once. So it doesn't necessarily, it, so it happens for a reason because they charted it, but they did it so that way they can excel faster. So that it can excel faster. And people do ask, what's the point? Without of- a hierarchy, without a hierarchy. I understand, take- but-, but the- show- Okay, interesting. She showed sure. me a passport, getting it stamped. She said forgiveness. She said gratitude. She said love. She said love has a lot. <laughs> She's showing me stamps all over. And then she said um, heartache. And then she said, you know, being without a parent. And then she's like, it's a passport of the universe. And a lot of people just want to go to all the different places all at once to get to be able to further themselves to go to a different galaxy. Even To she- graduate. Right. And let's talk about graduation for a second. That was so fascinating. It and is. That was great. Never... Okay. <laughs> but, Lou, I'm just holding on to her, her meteor here, which is talking about graduation. So let's say we've gone through all our lifetimes. No one graduates. <laughs> but, I mean, well, we graduate to become guides, let's say, and we stop incarnating because we're guiding other people. We stop doing that. Correct? Because in your world, yes. And so guides also have guides and guides have teachers and guides have mentors and guides have all the way, let's say, up the scale without there being a higher. You don't quit. You just multiply. So whether it's more lifetimes or more people or more like. Oh, wow. So she showed me someone standing up on the stage and they have thousands that they're at the Rose Bowl and everyone's there for them. She goes, that looks like a graduation. So in my case, I asked my guide. This is one of my first books. I said, so what was your journey? And he said, well, I went through all my lifetimes. And when I graduated, my graduation gift was you. 
She goes, <laughs> she's kidding. She actually put him in bars. Maybe it was prison. <laughs> so the punishment that he got for those, but I'm saying he graduated yeah, to become whatever, a guy. Right. And whatever you have done is helping him as well. Right. But I'm just saying he normally doesn't incarnate anymore unless I've asked him. And apparently I did at some point in one of my journeys to play my role, my grandfather. But he has a guide. He's a guide who has a guide. So that guide's no longer incarnating. Or the people in councils I've asked, they go, no, I don't, I'm not, I don't need to come back. I'm done. <laughs> they want no part of it. Like, if you guys are that stupid to ruin your planet, we want, like, we're here to help you. But if you can't even listen on the simplest things of like. True. You know, <laughs> However, as we know, there's other options besides Earth, as we know. To yeah, she to says that on. Earth has the most stamped so you can ever get she goes you can get one stamp in 500 years on some other planet she one goes, stamp in 500 years but the most stamps in one lifetime here on earth in one day in one feeling in one episode of your life in one day one feeling one episode of your life i'm repeating it because we've heard that in the sense that you can go you can learn you can learn more on one day of tragedy on earth than you can in 500 years in some boring place but so Lou, you've got a full up passport. Have you, you're, I know you're waiting for your peeps to come back so you can plan your next journey, but you have a clue what that might be? When you get back, she wants you to help her from the other side. Figure it out. Figure it out. Funny. And will it be on earth? That's she wants question. to learn how to play the piano. Okay. She wants to be her cat. <laughs> Don't we all? Uh, Hira, I Hira, guess that's Hira, well, Robert's going to be Hira. All right, but let's ask about that. I mean, look, people talk about cats and incarnating as animals. Is this something that's in your path and journey, or is that just a like a comic metaphor? She said that um, we all do this together. We're like in a bubble that just goes burst. We all do this together. Very cool. Jennifer has to go. All right, well, Lou, any last thoughts on this really unusual conversation about me? <laughs> she said you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All She's right, Lou, what? Go ahead. This podcast, when, they can, when somebody can actually get through all of it, that they learn so much that we're taking the fear away from them. We're, with, we're, we're putting, sorry. We don't do that. We put your awareness in a place that you feel more confident about who you are and that you're never alone and that you have so many people rooting for the best for you that want you to love that person, want you to have that experience. They want you to know that sometimes, and they just showed me in my mind's eye, sometimes it takes years to get from 2009 to last Sunday without understanding it. With yeah. thinking it was crazy when I was in 2009, I went, that's a little nutty. I feel like I'm going to meet someone. Like, that's crazy. But yeah. it's our new normal. And the quickening is so fast that whenever, whatever you vacillate on, it's going to happen. So be great. The whole reason for, there's a lot of reasons for gratitude. But gratitude brings you an element of energy that comes back to you. And so, I mean... We don't have to go over that, but. Well, no, it's, we're talking, this is hacking the afterlife and we're getting life hacks from the afterlife, which is that gratitude, just as an emotion or a thought or a concept, if you can allow it into your field of reference, it'll change your life. I mean, I, I'm not, that's not a term from my background, but I understand it, which is being grateful for being on the planet. Right. Grateful for the people that you love and or that take care of you or that help you. It's not hard to be grateful. Right. But it's hard to navigate the planet as we know. So thank you. Or as she's showing me, or to think that you're in charge of it or in charge of anybody else. Right. You guys are so, <laughs> she goes, you guys are so narcissistic. You actually think you have control over things. You don't. Get over yourselves. Wow. Get off. <laughs>
it. Get over yourselves and get on with it. And stop yeah. thinking that you're in charge of anyone else. Help your, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself or whatever that means or help others. But don't think you have control over their outcomes. Don't think you have control over your kids' outcomes. Help them. But stop like stop obsessing over what you did wrong it's wasted guilt and what you can't control you you can't control how other people behave but you can control how you react to them yes i love that concept thank you lou i appreciate it thank you jennifer for your gifts and we will catch you love you, love you. we'll catch you next week on the flip side this has been hacking the afterlife podcast with jennifer schaefer for more information jenniferschafer.com, martinizone.com, or richmartini.com. Hacking the Afterlife documentary is available on Gaia.com via Amazon Prime.